Uh, well, welcome to our panel. My name is Inka Eriksdottir. I'm a member of the steering committee of Drawdown East End. We're presenting this panel as part of series in partnership with the Rogers Memorial Library and the League of Women Voters. Uh, many of you ha have heard about sustainable fashion. The scientists at Project Drawdown tell us that as the climate crisis, biodiversity loss and land degradation escalate, the time is now to move beyond sustainable fashion and incorporate regenerative fashion. Many top designers and brands are implementing climate beneficial materials and we can all embrace a climate fashion lifestyle. Let's talk about how with our four panelists. Well, thank you, Inga. Um, eco, green, regenerative, sustainable, circular, vintage, they all resonate with me. Uh, I learned about circular fashion from my mom. Um, she sewed all her dresses and many of, for my, my sister and me, and she encouraged us to sew, uh, to find things in thrift shops and remake things into something new. Her idea was be creative, fashionable, have fun with the way you dress. And we thought she always looked very Vogue. <laughs> I was surprised to learn of the science from Project Drawdown the organization uh, that I co-founded um, and Inga's on our steering committee. Well, anyway, Project Drawdown has said that fast, the fast fashion industry produces 10% of our carbon emissions, is the second largest consumer of the world's water supply and pollutes the oceans with microplastics. Uh, one garbage truck full of clothes is burned or dumped in a landfill every second. So a group of us here on the East End were inspired by Drawdown to take action. Drawdown has 80 climate solutions that can reverse global warming. For the fashion industry, Drawdown did the math, showing us we can reduce fashion carbon emissions a lot uh, by shifting to regenerative and circular fashion. Our panelists are all involved in positive solutions. Shall we hear from them now, Inga? Yes. Um... I'm gonna introduce our four um, panelists. We're gonna have um, Ingvar Helgason, who is um, the co-founder and CEO of Vitro Labs, uh, where fashion, technology, and sustainability intersect. Beth Finetti, founder, green inside and out author, green wardrobe guide. Lissy Swigert, owner of the Times Vintage Shop in Greenport, showcasing eco fashion and thrifting. And Anne Therese, a uh, climate optimist, uh, ex model, entrepreneur, sustainability coach, writer, and a stubborn believer in collective positive change. Uh, we're so excited to have you all here. And we're going to start with Ingvar. Um, can you tell us about your work in the fashion industry and how you see it moving toward a circular economy? and also tell us about the alternative regenerative fabrics you are creating. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And, uh, and, and well, first of all, fashion is something that I've lived and breathed since I was 16 years old. I, I dropped out of high school to become a fashion designer. So I've, I've literally worked in, in the fashion industry my entire life. I'm, I'm, I'm 40 now. So, so more than half my life, I've been involved in fashion in, in some way, shape or another. So it's an industry that I care a lot about. And it's an industry that, uh, that I've seen change immensely over the last 24 years that I've been, uh, been connected to it. Um, I had a brand for my, my own brand for 10 years and uh, it's uh, seeing the industry and not just the industry, but consumers adopting and starting to understand the need for us to do better. Uh, it's it's been eye opening over the last uh, few years, and it's really accelerated over the last two years. So, um, um, I started Retro Labs out of the need for finding you know, a replacement for the most environmentally destructive materials that are, that we're using in the in the fashion industry. Um, so, I'm going to share some slides here and kind of talk you through roughly kind of what it is that we're focusing on, what the impact is that we're trying to mitigate and, uh, and kind of what the, what the future uh, holds for, for leather specifically is the material that, that we're working with um, and the impact that it has. Um, so is the screen share working? Everybody seeing? Fantastic. Yes. So 
Um, we're building the future of leather with uh, a technology called cellular agriculture. Now, question is, what is cellular agriculture? Cellular agriculture, it's a production of agricultural products from cell cultures and basically using the building blocks of life um, that are found in nature, but harnessing them in a way that we can control and that we can grow the products that we need in a environmentally friendly way, in a sustainable way, and in a regenerative way. So when you're looking at cell ag as a field, um, you might have heard about um, companies that are producing meat uh, or fish or dairy or eggs using, using these, te these technologies. The concept of cellular agriculture is not new. Um, it was actually first written about, um, it wasn't named cellular agriculture, but it was written about by Winston Churchill back in 1932. So he, he wrote an article in uh, Popular Mechanics. Um, the article is called 50 Years Hence. And uh, he, was think he, was, he was conceptualizing what the future would look like in 50 years. Um, it took, it's gonna take like 100 years probably rather than the 50 years that he had, uh, that he had projected. But uh, he was talking about the madness of growing an entire chicken when you only are growing it for the meat or for the eggs specifically. So he envisioned this future where we would just be growing exactly you know, the products of the animals that we need. Now, almost 100 years later, this is actually becoming a reality. So when we're looking at this space, um, it's the alternative versus replacement. So on one hand, we have the alternative and the other, we have the replacement. In the food sector, it's the veggie burgers that we all know and, uh, and have been available in the market for, for, for decades. Um, the new version of these, um, which is kind of a stopgap solution, is, uh, is, is companies like Impossible Foods, which have, uh, where you can buy these burgers now in supermarkets and in, 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 a, in a lot of stores. They use specific processes from cellular agriculture to create uh, specific proteins that they add to the plant-based uh, burgers to kind of give them the color, give them the taste, uh, specifically of the protein heme, which is, which is found in, in, in the bloodstream of, of animals, but, uh, but they do it in yeast. Um, and then there's a true replacement, companies like Memphis Meats um, and, and others that are growing the real burger, so growing real meat uh, from the cells of animals, so from the muscle cells. Again, no animals are harmed during this process and it's a very scalable process and, and it's, it's done in controlled environments. When you, have the, when you look at the material space, and specifically for the vertical of leather, we have uh, companies like Pinatex uh, and a number of other companies that I'll show you kind of a, a list of uh, in a bit. Um, they're creating kind of an alternative to leather and uh, using plant-based materials. Um, they are you know, grape leathers, they are apple leathers, they are mushroom leathers. Um, so a variety of of of, of uh, options in that space. Um, then there are kind of stopgap solutions. Modern Meadow Company that uses again using yeast. They produce uh, genetically modified yeast. They use uh, that to produce collagen, which is the building block of of uh, of leather. And then there are companies like ours um, that are growing the actual leather uh, from animal cells. So why leather? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a product that uh, that kind of we know and love. But but why are we choosing leather specifically? So leather has been a staple of our wardrobes for thousands of years. Um, this is a shoe that was found in a cave in Armenia um, five thousand five hundred years ago that she was worn, uh, predates the pyramids by a thousand years. Um, so just kind of give you, gives you the scale of, of the history of, of, this, of these products. So again, leather has been used by humanity for, 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 for thousands and thousands of years. In our current environment, it's as well everywhere. We have it in shoes, we have it in furniture, we have it in, in cars, we have it in uh, accessories, even in sports. So again, it's, 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 this, it's a, such a versatile material. When we're looking at the kind of vertical that we're targeting, the brands, again, that some of you might know and love. Um, I, I, I have a few products from a few of these companies myself, um, having worked in the fashion industry. They rely on leather goods as, as a huge source of their revenue. So again, Hermes, they make approximately $3.4 billion annually um, on leather goods, Chanel $6.6 .6 billion, Louis Vuitton $4.4 billion, and Prada around $2 billion. And so again, the amount of leather goods that they're selling annually, it's, I mean, it's, it's, unimaginable. 
So what is leather? It's of course the hide of a cow. Uh, and uh, sorry if anybody's going to have dinner soon uh, for the picture here on the left, but, uh, but, but this is unfortunately how uh, the hides are packed up and shipped to the tanneries. Um, and leather, it's, um, it's, the, uh, it's the dermal skin of a cow. Um, again, kind of after the hair and the top layer of what is called the epidermal layer has, has been removed. Um, and this is an extremely versatile material that then get changed, gets changed into the products that we know and love through a tanning process. And it's that tanning process that kind of that, that binds the collagen proteins and other structural proteins. Um, and again, a cowhide can become any of the products that I, that I showed you earlier. So whether that's a that's a that's a car seat or a, or a soft leather glove or a handbag or whatever else. So it's it's an extremely versatile material. Now, the problem with any product. If you do it in small at a small scale, it's environmentally friendly and it's ethical. But but of course, as soon as you industrialize a process, that kind of falls by the wayside. So it is leather sourcing is in the dark ages. It's a co-product, uh, not directly a byproduct of the meat industry, because again, um, the value of leather is approximately between kind of three and ten percent of the cow. So again, it's a significant uh, revenue driver for for farmers. So it, it, it props up the meat industry as well. The problem, multiple problems, but there's runoff and water pollution, which is uh, eutrophication of uh, waterways. So again, kind of dead zones that get created in the Gulf, uh, Gulf of Mexico and other places where there's, where there's large scale industrial runoff from, from farms. Um, we have deforestation and displacement. Um, there's, of course, this is happening at a huge scale in Brazil. Um, there were, 10 of the largest, uh, I think, European car companies that got, got, got caught out recently that they had been purchasing leather where they didn't know it, where it came from. Turned out it was from Paraguay. Uh, so it was displacing indigenous people and again, kind of destroying the, 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 na the natives' lands. Then of course we have greenhouse gas emissions and uh, of course unethical uh, animal treatment. So all of these combined, it's, 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 it's a huge problem that we're, that we're facing. Now, after the cow is slaughtered and the and the hide goes kind of starts traveling around the world, so it doesn't just end with the with the farm. Um, the hide itself it travels approximately nineteen thousand miles before it is actually made into a product that we know and love. Um, so again, you know, the the whole supply chain uh, in this in this industry is 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 pretty broken. The reason. Another reason why we chose leather. So this is uh, these are this is a public report from the Caring Group. So the Caring owns uh, companies like Gucci, uh, Bottega Veneta, and other um, brands that that most people know. When you look at leather, uh, which is again kind of I'm sorry for the small writing here, but uh, but I'll, I'll kind of take you through the graph um, uh, briefly. But leather here on the far left, um, that's the environmental impact of the materials that this group uses. Um, so it's an outsized portion of both land use, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, water consumption and water pollution, and, and air emissions. And you can see that the Caring Group, they use approximately, what is it, 47 million kilos um, or 90 million pounds uh, of, uh, of, of leather annually, uh, which translates into, well, vast quantities. Lots of handbags, basically. There is hope, which is good. Uh, so when we look at the leather alternative and leather replacement landscape, um, we're seeing huge, um, it's, it's a hugely growing industry. So leather alternatives have been in the market since the 1960s. Uh, we have uh, had, of course, pleather, um, which, which, was, which was huge. And, uh, and that market has, has kind of taken off in, in car interiors and, and other products. Um, we're seeing now the, you know, there's mycelium leather, which is a super exciting technology. So using mushrooms to grow leather. So there are a number of companies, Microworks, Bolt Threads, Ecovative, uh, Mycelium, and uh, Microtex. So again, this is a this is a booming market. Fermentation, as I you know, as I briefly described earlier, kind of using some of the building blocks, but gone gotten in a, in a in a new way through through fermentation. And then cultivation companies like uh, like ourselves and and a company called Corium, uh, so they're basically create recreating leather from the on the from the cell uh, from the cells of animals. Now, traditional leather, and uh, we're using 
using ourselves here as an example in, in kind of the, the efficiency of, of this new process. Um, so traditional leather can take up to three years um, to get from a cow to the final leather product. So of course, um, with all the problems that were listed um, before, um, versus our process, which takes about five weeks. So if we grow, it takes our uh, hides four weeks to grow in custom-made bioreactors. Um, we then harvest those hides, and then those hides are treated in, in a similar way as a, as a regular cow hide. Now, with our process, because again, we only grow what is needed rather than having a thick cow hide that you then need to kind of tan and use chemicals to kind of penetrate all the way through and then remove every kind of impurities and things like that. We only grow up to what is needed. So our process uses 90% fewer chemicals, much less water and, and, and kind of takes much less time to, to grow. So again, there are so many opportunities for, for um, optimizing of, of this, uh, this material that we, that we all know and love. So just to give you a small idea of what this process looks like, we've this uh, happens in, in an automated uh, growth platform that, that we've developed. Um, the hides themselves grow inside these uh, boxes that, that, you, that you see in, the, in this, what looks like a, kind of a wine fridge, but, uh, but yeah, it's a similar concept to a wine fridge. Um, after the uh, hide grows into the full thickness, which is done in a fully automated way, we harvest the hide, it comes out, it's a cow hide uh, from cow cells, and then we tan it, and then can create products uh, from this. These are some sample products that we that we've made. Um, it, it means in no way that we have any affiliations with the companies like Apple. <laughs> that the photo of uh, photo of the Apple Watch is there. It's just uh, um, I, I wear the Apple Watch, so I wanted to see if we could make product like that. So this is um, this is kind of the new the new. Well, I, as, as I had a conversation with a, with, a, with a luxury executive and he basically said, well, what you have here in Guar is the, is the new exotic. So again, while we're doing it, this is at a small scale. This is like the new exotic. These are the new exotic hides that are coming to market. Um, of course, the target is to make this available to everyone and, uh, and get everyone to be using these leathers down the line. But, uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's a process that we're, that we're scaling up to now. So what does the future hold? We're looking at where animals like the cow, like the chicken, like the like like pigs, like every you know every animal that that is being consumed at an industrial scale, we are looking at a future where we can change how we grow these animals, how we grow the products that we use from these, these animals, and not because we want to eradicate cows, but we want to the cows that actually do roam the earth uh, to have a life. We want them to be able to live out their life like they would do in nature. Uh, we don't want to kind of harness them and, 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 and make, them, make them kind of tie them to our consumption needs. So this is uh, a future that we are working towards. This is a future that multiple other companies uh, adjacent to us are working on. And, and I'm super excited what the next five to 10 years are going to look like uh, in this industry. Wow, that was in incredibly, uh, impressive uh, slides on what you guys are doing. Um, I uh, had never even heard about this uh, process or that this would be a, a opportunity to make vegan leather. So it's uh, incredibly interesting. Um, personally, I related also to uh, having been in the industry for 20 years and having so much passion about making it better. And how can we, how can we create uh, a fashion that is, you know, good for the the earth and uh, well, just uh, what it currently is. Um, I mean, I, I love I love leather goods and 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 I, I don't want people to stop consuming like buying leather goods and I don't want people to stop buying the products that they know and love. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, we just we just need to find a better way to make them. Yeah, it's an amazing story, Ingvar. Thank you. It's cellular agriculture. I love that. And you know, obviously, you love animals. You love the planet, and now you're finding a way to harmlessly grow a beautiful material. It, it's amazing. It's Thank really, you. really great. Um, I'd like to keep with materials and uh, let's ask Beth Fettini about her book, The Green Wardrobe Guide and her podcast and her blog. Um, Beth, could you tell us a little bit about um, what you're doing with sustainable, healthy living? 
Sure. Yes. Yeah. So I run a, a nonprofit organization called Green Inside and Out, and we're based up island in Huntington, but we cover all of Long Island. And um, many years ago, I used to work for an organization in D.C. called um, Beyond Pesticides, and I started to learn all about the horrible issues um, associated with the use of pesticides. And that's where I was introduced to um, organic cotton. And so at the time I was going around giving green living presentations like I still do, and I'd be wearing my eco fashions and everyone was saying to me, well, where did you get it? You know, can I touch it? And there was such curiosity about it at the time that I said, well, someone should write a book about it. So it was actually, um, Jet's Dream out in Greenport, who inspired me, um, she said, well, why don't you write a book? So I started the book in 2010. It's, it's there on the, on the screen. I have a copy here. Um, and it took me eight years to finish it, so I'm so glad it's published now. <laughs> but the idea was, um, next slide, um, because the, the, um, the fashion industry, as Mary mentioned, is considered the second largest polluter in, you know, of, the, of the earth after the oil industry, I thought it was important for people to understand, like, now we're, we're starting to eat organic food and we understand the importance of that, but we aren't necessarily thinking about the impacts of our clothing. So, um, you know, just as Ingvar mentioned, you know, there can be chromium use in, in the tanning of leather, for example. There are carcinogenic aromatic amines in some of the dyes. There can be allergens in the dyes. Heavy metals, um, organotins are a, a class of chemicals used in the making of polyester. Um, chlorinated benzenes and toluenes. Flame retardants are added to some fabrics. Formaldehyde is used to make clothing less wrinkle prone. And even phthalates. Phthalates are plasticizers um, that you find in even in personal care products, but they can be in the plastic, like on the writing on your t-shirt. Um, so all of these things, you know, are things we don't normally think about. So I just thought it was so important for people to be aware and conscious consumers. So next slide. Um, a lot of people don't realize that polyester is actually made of plastic. Over 80% of polyester is manufactured using antimony as a catalyst, which is a carcinogen. It's also toxic to the heart, lungs, liver, and skin. And as Mary mentioned, when we wash polyester, even though it lasts a long time and it has good durability, so that's a positive, it does tend to shed little microplastics, which are too small. Um, you know, they're small enough to fit through the sewage treatment plants and they end up going out into our water bodies. Um, so that's becoming a big problem. Next slide. So I'm, I'm vegan, so sorry, Ingvar. <laughs> so my book tended to focus on um, plant-based fabrics. Um, so organic cotton, as I mentioned, conventional cotton is um, responsible for 25% of the world's pesticide use. Um, a lot of times it's also genetically modified. So it's really exciting from the research I did in the book to find out that organic cotton, which is grown without pesticides, um, is a small but growing percentage of the overall cotton market. And it's grown in many different countries. You can see there um, some of the um, large, uh, even athletic clothing vendors like Nike, they've committed to using over 50% organic or recycled cotton in their products. Um, even fast fashion brands like H&M are starting to use organic uh, or recycled cotton in their clothing. They have their conscious collection, um, which is controversial among the very purists in the, in the sustainability movement, of course. Um, but it's very important to look as consumers to look for certain labels, such as GOTS, the Global Organic Textile Standard, because it really does set specific standards um, for the, the, um, the use of, the, you know, the manufacturing of the cotton and also to look for the fair trade label because that incorporates the issue of, you know, the, the conditions in the workplace where garment workers are making our clothing, which is also very important as part of sustainability. Next slide. Another um, fabric that I focus on in the book is hemp. And um, this is not the same thing as marijuana. <laughs> you cannot smoke your skirt. 
um, <laughs> only a very a small amount of the chemical THC um, in the industrial uh, hemp that's used for fabric. Um, it's a very hardy plant. It can be harvested three times per year. It kind of feels like linen and um, it's been grown for thousands of years. They say George Washington and Thomas Jefferson both cultivated hemp. Next slide. Another great um, plant-based fiber to look for or fabric is Lyocell. And you might see the name brand Tencel because there's one particular Austrian company that makes the bulk of Lyocell. And it's made out of eucalyptus trees. Um, you know, the, it goes from like, you see the picture on the bottom from the wood into pulp and then into the fiber. It's put through, you know, spinnerets to make the thread. Um, really pretty amazing. And it's, it uses a lot less water than cotton. Any kind of cotton, even organic, tends to use a lot of water. Um, modal is another type of cellulosic fib fiber made specifically from beech trees. So you can look for all these, these um, types of fabrics on the label. Next slide. So I wanted to just put in sort of a summary slide of how to green up your wardrobe, you know, in a very simple steps. Um, and first I wanted to point out that um, adding to Mary's uh, statistics there, it said that 85% of clothing ends up in landfills. That's according to the EPA. So my first uh, tip is decide if you really need it. Um, if you don't, you don't need to buy something. Um, determine if what you need could be found at a thrift store, at a consignment shop, or these online reselling sources, um, like Etsy is one of them. When you do need new clothing, seek natural fabrics that have the least environmental impact, like Ingvar was describing, or some of the plant-based fabrics I was talking about, and especially also to look for natural dyes. Um, dyes can be made from plants and, and minerals and things like that, and they really do, um, can become quite vibrant. So something else to look for. Um, laundering clothing using eco-friendly methods, that's part of it. It's a big a part of the impact of our clothing is how we launder them, because we there's so many chemicals in the detergents. So to seek um, fragrance-free, because the fragrances can contain phthalates, which I mentioned, and the phthalates help make the, the smell of the soap last longer. You even see television ads bragging about this, but mm -hmm. those are hormone disrupting chemicals. Um, so <laughs> uh, there's plenty of bio-based soaps to use. Um, instead of tossing salvageable clothing, mend it. Like Mary said, her mom taught her to do that. Don't just throw it out because it's missing a button. Um, and of course, donate clothing in good condition back to a thrift store so that it can be reused. And in fact, um, my organization is currently working on a white paper we hope to release soon um, about where you can donate all your clothing on Long Island and why it's important. So we'll have a list up on our website soon, hopefully. Next okay, slide. That's great. <laughs> we put we put a lot of your um, information in the chat box so people can you know find your website and uh, about your book and I love your tips. Um, I'll add another one, which is if you don't use your dryer, your clothes last longer. <laughs> Hang them up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Natural sun and wind. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Beth. Sure. Um, let's so let's move on to thrift shopping. Can we? And, oh, uh, think, uh, you're still uh, you still have a little bit left, or oh, was that the first slide? Yes, no. Just I'll wrap up really quickly. Please do, please do. Um, just you know where the industry needs to go from here. Um, we just need to pay more attention to environmental impacts, as you mentioned earlier. We need to look towards circular or cradle to cradle manufacturing, like Patagonia actually will take back its its clothing and recycle it into new clothing. Um, there definitely needs to be more transparency in labels so that consumers can make good decisions. And of course, looking for those standards, like I mentioned before. And um, I think that's all. I was just going to mention that we're also part of um, the Just Green Partnership in New York State. And I'm also on the advisory board of a wonderful organization called Fashion Forward, um, which is trying to address the issue of toxins in, in the, the fashion industry. And we're working on legislation in New York State, hopefully to try to ban the use of PFAS, which is the fire retardants, the perfluoroalkyl substances in textiles. So we'll see, we're just at the beginning of that process. 
Oh, wow. Incredible. So I feel like maybe I've me. seen something about it maybe from Anne Therese, who posts a lot about the, one of our panelists, what's happening yeah. in the industry. But that's really exciting. Yes. And really helpful tips. We're, we're part of the New York City Fair Trade Coalition, and um, they're also doing quite a bit. And it's very exciting to see a lot of young people in the fashion industry very interested in this. So I have a lot of hope for the future. Amazing. I wanted to add, just because it's on, on, on my mind, um, I'm in Iceland and um, we have this new, a fairly new thing here. It's been very popular in Denmark for years, but it's a place where you can have a little rack and sell your clothes, but someone organizes the whole store and you have maybe a hundred different racks. Mm -hmm. And it's become the most popular place, I feel, <laughs> To buy especially for kids because they grow out of their clothes so quickly mm -hmm. so for parents to sell clothes that are in good shape or buy for their the kids so it's it's uh, become so much more regenerative here than it used to so it's nice Great. to see i love hearing that yeah yeah um let's Thank move you. on to thrift shopping and elizabeth swigert whose dream uh it was to open her own thrift shop which she did, Time's Vintage Shop in Greenport. Hello, I'm Elizabeth, or Lizzie, as some people call me. Um, seven years ago, my dad, Michael, and I opened um, a vintage shop together here in Greenport. And my love of vintage, um, it started out purely just because I love the style of the 60s and 70s. And I was aesthetically drawn to the unique clothes of, of the past. And I always thought that I would have a shop. And um, I'm so fortunate that we've had the shop now for seven years. And each year that we have this business, I'm, I'm realizing um, the importance of shopping secondhand. And it's something I'm really passionate about. Um, I see people bring clothing in to us all the time. We're always getting new stuff. Um, it's, it's an amazing, um, it's just an amazing opportunity to be able to see things getting recycled. Uh, my mom is, <laughs> she's also sort of part of our team, even though she lives in Texas, she's um, repurposing a lot of items and using materials that a lot of people would think, you know, ready for the trash, but she'll make these beautiful handbags. And um, it's pretty amazing because they're, they're really popular, especially with the younger um, generations, which I think are, are even more conscious than most of you know, my peers and adults that I know. So that's really cool to see young people getting really into thrifting and vintage. And um, yeah, I don't know. No, that's <laughs> great, Lizzie. Before, so I don't really know what I'm doing, but. I, no, I, I love hearing what you're saying. And um, I know we have this video that I thought would interest people. It's uh, the winning Story Fest submission by a college student it's two minutes, but it's her story of thrifting for the soul. Her name is Kenna Kelly. So we'll just show that and, and then I'll ask you another question. <laughs> there is sound. Thrifting has become a part of my routine and culture. As a college student working almost full-time, thrifting is a way for me to express myself through clothing on a budget. Through college and now taking my first environment-related class, I have learned to appreciate thrifting in a new, earth-conscious way. The average American throws away approximately 80 pounds of clothing and textiles annually. Only 15% of clothing is recycled or donated, leaving the rest to end up in the trash, occupying nearly 5% of total landfill space. 
clothing will sit in landfills for 200 or more years. And as it decomposes, it emits methane, a greenhouse gas more potent than carbon. By doubling the life of clothing from even one to two years, we can help reduce emissions from clothing production and disposal by as much as 24%. On a personal note, when I thrift, I feel good. I struggle with anxiety and thrifting has been a great outlet for me when I feel overwhelmed to get out of the house and focus on my passion for fashion. I feel good not only from the deals I am getting or the fun I'm having experimenting with clothes, but I feel good because I'm saving the environment. Now I asked some of my best friends to model their favorite thrifted outfits for me. And this was the result. Whether you're an experienced thrifter or maybe never have before, I urge you to think about your impact the next time you shop for clothes. Thrifting is not only good for the earth, but great for the soul. And you have, uh, uh, Liz, you have also an Etsy site where you sell uh, vintage now. Um, and actually, you, had, you have closed because of the pandemic for most of the last year? or So this year, so we closed for three months um, during the lockdown. And when retail was able to reopen, I don't even, I guess it was, is it June? I don't even remember, mm, but yeah, I think we so. reopen and um, we're luckily our shop is a pretty large space. So it hasn't been too much of an issue with shoppers um, wearing their masks. Everyone's been really great about kind of following the guidelines, but I no longer sell on Etsy. I actually um, this year, actually in the past couple of months, I just started selling um through urban outfitters marketplace okay and, um they're a company that i i shopped at when i was you know younger and you know even high school through college i loved that brand but i never really knew anything about urban outfitters and um they started in the 70s and they um you know, I don't know how they make their clothes, but I know that they've created this marketplace where people like me or even just other, um, you know, people that love vintage can sell their recycled stuff on oh, wow. the giant platform. Okay. And it's been a really good supplement to the shop um, during the winter. And mm -hmm. I just, I'm very grateful and I, it's also part of the movement of just getting more people into to secondhand, which I think is awesome. That would be great no, if you have a link Etsy, to share. <laughs> Sorry? We're not on Etsy anymore. No, 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 no. Okay, I, I, I thought I'd heard that from Mary, but, uh, but it would be great if you have a link to share because uh, I would love to see it and I know everyone would love to check it out. I should yeah. have more stuff online, but I, I am old school at heart and Honestly, I, I, I don't have a ton on there. I, I believe in like feeling and touching and trying on clothes when mm -hmm. possible. During a pandemic, it's hard, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's really great. I really love your shop, and uh, yeah, I can't wait to visit next time. I'm over. Thank you. I, I've heard that the vintage in Iceland is very good as well. I have some friends there, so. Oh yeah, yeah it is. It's very uh, popular here as well. Uh, well, I'm going to move um, over to our fourth panelist um, who calls herself a climate activist, Anne Therese. You might know her from her modeling or she's also a sustainability coach and a stubborn believer in collective positive change. Uh, Anne Therese, can you tell us about what you're doing to move our world toward uh, collective positive change? Hi, thank you for having me. So happy to be here. Um, yeah, I am. Um, first of all, lovely presentation for everyone. I'm currently wearing my one of my favorite thrifted items. I actually thrifted this myself years ago. I give it away to a friend 
And I was like, can I have my sweater back? Because <laughs> I miss it. So it's been like really circulating and it's one of my favorite objects. Um, yeah, do you want me to start my presentation right away, Inge? Uh, that would be great. I'm just going to add, if there are questions from uh, our participants, please uh, write them in the, in the chat and then we'll get to them after the, the fourth uh, presentation and then we can ask everyone. But yeah, you okay. can just go right ahead. <laughs> All right, awesome. awesome. Let's see. Okay, can everyone... I need to do this. Sorry. I see it. I see the, the okay. first slide. All right. Are we good? Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. So yes, like Inga said, I'm Anne Therese. I call myself the climate optimist. And um, basically when I started out learning about the environment and I became an activist in my own way, I was very much an angry activist, as I call it. I was frustrated with the world. I was angry with myself. I tried to force change upon people around me that didn't work at all. And long story short, I spent a lot of unnecessary years being angry all the time and tired and just kind of running myself to the ground. And I said, okay, there needs to be a different way to do this because I'm not going to be able to sustain myself or the work keeping up this way. So slowly I started trying new things and I became what I call myself today, the climate optimist. And what I'm very passionate about is humans, um, how we work, how, um, like, when do we change our lives? When do we not change? So I'm very uh, just kind of passionate and interested in humans and change and like how we perceive risk and like, when do we go for things and not? And also, of course, I'm very passionate about climate. So I kind of tied those two together to, to kind of figure out like, why are we not doing more about climate change? And that's the biggest question that I keep asking myself and have been asking myself for years. And in studying a lot of psychology and just human behavior um, and also climate change and environmentalism, I come to a few things and now I'm very passionate about teaching these things to other people to kind of help people be more um, excited, empowered and active activists, not just every now and then, but every single day. And the two key pillars that I keep talking about that I'm personally very passionate about is everyday activism and optimism. And I thought I was just gonna share a little quickly about the two of them and to kind of like um, convince you that you should be too. And then also how that actually ties into fashion. So let's start with everyday activism, because many people might say, why is that important? My individual, ac individual actions may not matter because there are corporations out there ruining the planet. There are politics we need to care about. Like I'm such a small fish in a huge pond. So like, do my actions really matter? And I know it's very easy to feel that way. There are days when I feel the same, but here's a few reasons why I personally believe that everyday activism is maybe the most uh, important activism of all. First of all, it goes down to empowerment. So by being the change you wish to see in the world, that empowers you daily. And I'm also very, um, ex not excited, I'm very interested lately about climate anxiety and depression and how actually, unfortunately, we're seeing a huge rise in those numbers, especially among younger people. And we're seeing just more people being more anxious about the future and feeling like they can't do anything about it. And the best way to get out of anxiety and depression is to actually start doing something. Because when you start pulling the future that you want to see closer, you automatically feel more excited, more optimistic, uh, and more empowered. So if anything, I always say, just do whatever you can to make yourself feel better. And I think that's really important because we cannot continue showing up for all this work unless we feel like, you know, I can actually do this and I really want to continue doing this. So if not for everyone else, do it for yourself. Secondly, obviously, when you do things, you're planting seeds, right? Like if you are that weirdo, maybe who shows up with your, your own bag, or your own water bottle, or just kind of like, hey, can I have my coffee in this cup? Doesn't work that well right now because it's COVID. But in general, in general, <laughs> if you are that person who just has the courage to do things differently, you're planting seeds. Someone else is going to see that and be like, hmm, maybe I can also do that, right? And then the more people that are doing something differently, we start setting new trends. And we're talking about fashion here. We all know like, someone shows up with that weird, whatever it might be, red shirt, right? And the first day it's like, who's that guy in a red shirt? And then a few days later, someone else wears a red shirt and then suddenly there's a trend. So we need to see activists in the same way. How can we start setting trends and how can we be those brave people who dare to do things a little bit differently and continue doing them? And by doing so, we just show other people that that's okay because we are social creatures and we tend to always look to our surroundings and pick up clues of like what's acceptable what are other people doing? And if more people do something, it's just more okay. So it's really important for that reason too. And of course, just the fact that every action adds up and if more people do it, it's gonna make a big difference in the long run. And then also, again, it fuels your optimism. Uh, and I'm big on this part and I'll tell you more why soon, but 
the more you do something, you just give yourself a reason to be optimistic about it. And I always say, optimism isn't something you choose. It's something you create, right? You can't just tell yourself, I'm going to be optimistic because you have a bullshit detector that's going to say, no, you're not. Because there's so many reasons why we shouldn't be optimistic and then maybe have a crappy day. and You just don't feel optimistic anymore. Um, and so every time I talk about optimism, not every time, but many times people say, well, it's easy to say you want to be optimistic, but just look around and reality isn't optimistic. Well, you have to create your own optimism. And so in other words, you have to show up for that work and give yourself reasons to be optimistic. And that is why I think everyday activism is so important for that particular reason. And so what I say, you have to be an optimist in action. You can't just be an optimist because you can't just sit back and be like, oh, I just think everything's gonna be great because that's not how it works. Well, if you wanna be an optimist, then show the world that you're an optimist and do the work yourself. And by doing that, you feel more empowered. You feel like there are reasons for hope because by just being the change, you see that there's actual proof that we can do things differently. And that in itself is going to fuel your optimism. So why is optimism important? Um, and I know that's a great question as well. Well, a few, few reasons. I will just mention three. Um, the first one is that fear and anger, which I think is common, a common way to think about activism. Um, when you start to learn about the world and everything that's wrong about the world, um, it's easy to feel angry, like I did. Um, maybe you're afraid, like, do we have a future? What's going to happen? And Although those emotions are very good for triggering urgent action, like when you get angry at someone, you're like, I'm going to do something about this. And maybe you write a sign, you take to the streets and you start marching and you're just like, okay, we need to change the world. And you're so angry. And why does no one care? And why do corporations keep, you know, polluting the earth? It's great. But if you never transition from fear and anger into something different, you're going to run yourself dry. First of all, I've tried it many times. doesn't work. And also when you're angry and afraid, you have a very tunnel focused vision, which means that, and this is like goes way back, we had to escape like wild animals and stuff. Like when you're afraid of something, you're just focusing right what's in front of you so you can escape that very, very thing. But when you have a tunnel vision, it's very hard to like think outside the box to see something different. When it comes to figuring out climate change and building a different world, we have to be creative. We have to like be able to like think outside the box and come up with something completely different. So if we're just going to stay in the fear and anger, which I know that as an activist, you might feel like, well, if I'm not angry, I'm not serious about my work. Well, then you're going to stay very tunnel focused and it's not going to work on the sustainable long-term kind of change we need to see happen. That's reason number one. Also doom and gloom and shame, which we also very often talk about climate change in those terms. Like, you know, it's going to be a disastrous future. If we don't do, if we don't act now, like soon enough, this is going to happen. And you're trying to shame people like you're doing it wrong. And don't you know that by the way you're buying this plastic item, you're polluting the earth. And like, we're trying to shame people. We're trying to force upon this doom and gloom message for people to get to action. But what really happens is that you go into like this cognitive dissonance where like you start to realize things are wrong. And then you look yourself, you know, you look around yourself and be like, well, basically everything I'm doing is fueling climate change. And then you have this dissonance going on of like, I want to care, but it's too overwhelming. And how can I do this? And what really happens is you shut down and you add, you go into denial, which Many people think that denial is uh, rooted in ignorance, but most times denial is just self-defense because there's only so much we can take in as humans. And like when you reach a certain point, it's like you just can't take more, right? We have a certain like we also have to care about our kids and our jobs. And like, am I going to have dinner on the table tonight? So like if you keep attacking people with doom and gloom and shame and fear and anger, it gets to a point where like people just don't have the mental capacity to care about it. And if you look around, it's basically what we're seeing everywhere, right? So when we should, every one of us just wake up and get to action, people are just kind of like in their own world and trying to ignore what's going on. So on the other end, optimism opens up their brain to creativity and we can see solutions. So the more optimism you're able to create, not choosing, but create, you just open up your brain to like see things differently. Like, oh, maybe there is a different way that we can do things that is not worse than we're doing it now just different and maybe even better and so just by telling yourself that it's okay to be optimistic about the future because if we're not how are we ever going to get there right like we have to think about the future we want to see and start pulling that future closer so that is why i think optimism is absolutely important uh, i also understand it's very hard to be optimistic all the time but you can create your own optimism and that means showing up for the change you wish to see in the world maybe not every single day because it's okay to have a down day but as often as you can and how does this tie into fashion? Well, if you think about fashion, first of all, it is everyday, everyday activism, right? Like you get dressed every single day. 
even if you think you're a fashionista or someone who cares about fashion or not, you're putting something on your body. And so you do care about fashion because you're not going to walk around naked. So now we've learned a lot about fashion today. We know that it's polluting the planet by a lot, which is not great, but there are better brands out there. You can start thrifting. You can just clothing swap with friends. You can just wear what you already have. And so by just being more conscious of the clothes you're putting on every single day, you are actually doing a form of activism. Um, and I think it's really important to come back to remembering how important that activism is. Secondly, it is empowering, right? Because first of all, it's empowering to yourself. You can be like, every time you look down and see your shirt or like you feel yourself like, okay, I'm wearing a brand that I really believe in. Like, I feel proud of wearing this. I feel good about myself. Um, and I know that I'm choosing to sacrifice cheaper clothing or maybe buying new stuff every other week or so to wearing what you already have uh, because that's totally fine too and by doing that you're setting trends and you're telling other people it's okay to wear the same thing to the party three times in a row that's kind of cool these days um, and then also fashion and it's not always has been a very good way to empower others right you can wear something on your t-shirt that says something empowering uh, you can share messaging that way you can create your own t-shirts but fashion is and always has been a form of art form so it's by choosing how we wear our clothes and the message we put forth in the world. That's how we also empower other people. Uh, and lastly, to be conscious of your fashion is to be an optimist in action, because that is, I think, one of the easiest way, besides maybe eating and choosing where you're putting your plate, it's something you do every single day. And it just enables you to be an optimist in action. Um, and you can just see yourself in the mirror and be like, wow, this is cool. It's fun to care. And I'm making a change literally every single day just by getting dressed. Um, so yeah, those are my few takes on everyday activism, on optimism, on fashion. Uh, I would say as a last uh, just thought, wear your values and lay a vote for a different kind of world. I love the first phrase, wear your values that I stole from Remake, which is an incredible fashion organization that works for sustainability and ethical uh, practices in the industry. But yeah, um, I, I know it's easy to hate on fashion and we definitely definitely have to change the industry. But I think that if we think about it the right way, it can be very empowering both to ourselves and to others. Um, thank you for having me. Again, I'm the Climate Optimist. You'll find me on theclimateoptimist.com if you want to reach out and maybe have some more coaching. I teach, us, I teach a lot on this, um, which you might be able to see. I'm very passionate about this topic. So I'll start talk, <laughs> stop talking now and stop sharing my screen. This was so right, great, man. Thank you so much. Um, it's been so um, inspiring for me, who have, and I've been in the industry for so long, you know, 20 years, and I felt the guilt, you know, when I started to find out about how bad fashion was, you know, then I didn't want to model anymore. I was, you know, I stopped buying clothes for, you know, a few years, and then I just started buying vintage, and, you know, it's... Um, it's been inspiring to see you're such a good communicator through your Instagram and your, your website and everything on all the good things that are happening in fashion because there is so much good going on and there are great things. So it's been uh, been wonderful to to see that. And you started your own agency that has you know models for change, and I just think that's very very inspiring. Um, I see oh. that we have uh, we have quite a few questions. Um, should we go straight to that because we're close to an hour now, <laughs> Mary? Sure, I think that's be great. Okay. Um, Joanna, do you want to read a question out and see what's... That'd be great if you could do that. Um, let's see. While we're waiting, I was wondering, I'd love to do like a little lightning round and ask everybody um, if there were one thing that you could recommend that uh, we each do to be optimistic. Uh, um, everyday activists and, and uh, climate optimists, um, what would that be? Or regenerative? Anna, Therese, would you start? Sorry, you said the question is something to do every single day. Just That's... one thing that you, you would recommend we all do. Um, I always say compost your food. It's the first thing that comes to mind. It's just because it brings you back to the circle of life too. So you get to like be part of life again and to see your life kind of re-nurture itself. So I think that's one of the most empowering things to do. That's great. Ingvar? And I have compostable bras now too. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe other clothes too. Um, one, one thing? Read, read, read something kind of educate oneself on on what's going on in the world and uh, and not necessarily on all the bad stuff but as well kind of um, what is what is what are people doing around the world to kind of make the world a better place um because there are definitely some uplifting stories out there and uh 
and and yeah, it's it's possible to do from one's phone as well. So makes it makes it an makes it an easy easy thing to get done. There's yeah. even a magazine called Optimist, which I get in my inbox every day, and it has fantastic stories from around the world. That's optimistic funny. stories that are all to do with climate change. Mm. Lizzie, one thing that you would recommend people do? Um, I would recommend going to yard sales uh, in your neighborhood, or if you feel the urge to go shopping, go check out your local thrift shop. And um, yeah, like just keep wearing secondhand and um, being proud of what's on your body. And yeah. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> and Beth, she's, I don't see her. Is she still with us? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. One thing, there's so many things I would say yeah. probably go vegan, but um, the main thing is in court, like I said, incorporating the environment into everyday decisions. So like the next time you go to buy something on Amazon, ask yourself if there's a greener option or a greener way to do things. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And um, I was going to ask Inga if she would share maybe one tip or something that she's been doing. Um. I guess I'm, I'm focused a lot on my kids these days, so uh, educating them in taking care of their clothes and, you know, just modeling good behavior on, you know, we, we don't have a dryer, we, you know, air dry our clothes. And, and, um, and I grew up in a family of six kids and I wasn't really raised much of a consumer at all. We would just all use, you know, the clothes together and it's just very normal for me. So it's a, an easy thing to do. And I think just to, you know, take care of my clothes. Uh, my mother-in-law is amazing at knitting and I have some knit sweaters. So I hope that my daughters grow up wearing them and they can, you know, later no, when they're older, you know, have their kids wear them. So I'm just focused on that, kind of taking care of the clothes that I have. And, and I really enjoy wearing clothes that I know that my grandmother wore or my mom or just clothes with soul, especially when it's from people that I know that they wore them. Um, I can relate to that. I wear, um, I try to wear my mom's clothes, but she was a little smaller than I. <laughs> um, my tip is actually one from Paul Hawken. I heard him speak the, uh, a while ago on, uh, he's writing a new book called Regeneration. And he said that um, if we all just stuck to buying six new things a year, we would create a circular fashion industry. So I, I heard this in January and I said, I'll challenge myself for a new the new year to maybe do better than six. Maybe I can start and do buy only thrift and only recycled items. And so far so good. And I have to say, it feels great. Just buying recycled, going to yard sales, going doing thrift shops. Mm -hmm. um, I actually see now that the, the chat, the, the questions have been asked and answered. So, uh, Maybe if there's any other questions, uh, we could email people, but I think there was, uh, there was one question about the, um, eco leather. Mm -hmm. Um, what yes. is the cost per square foot? I guess. Per yeah. Square? Great question. Um, so the first, first traditional leather. Yeah. Yeah. The, the first batches that we're selling are at a, um, you know, at, at the similar price point to exotic leathers. So again, kind of, um, they will be premium priced. Um, but uh, we have a very clear path towards uh, matching and potentially beating um, traditional leather on, on price. Um, so that's uh, kind of any new technology that hits the market because of the kind of the limited quantities one is one is producing, the price is going to start off higher, but uh, but it comes down over time with with scale and optimization. And I saw from your website you're creating many different types of leather. Yeah, we have, uh, we have, I mean, uh, in our lab, we have uh, I mean, cells from crocodiles, ostriches, and, uh, and, and, and cows, and are looking at other species as well. So, so, so yeah, we're looking to replace well, all of them down the line. Fantastic. Um, so, and I see there, there's a question, sorry, too, about the tanning process. Um, so we have, uh, we're working with, uh, with a company that has a, a chromium-free tanning process. So again, uh, we're removing all the uh, heavy metals. Um, and uh, on top of that, we use 90% fewer chemicals in our process and, uh, and much less water as well. Um, so it is, uh, we're, we're, uh, we're doing it in a, in a, as environmentally friendly fashion as possible. Fantastic. Joanna, were there any other, um, 
questions in the chat that were not answered? Let me see really quickly. Um, what we're going to do um, when we close up, we will um, be emailing everyone all the links and the uh, any we'll look through the chat box and anything that was not answered, we will get answered and send it out as an email to everyone. So I, I know we're going to do that. Uh, there's a great question here, yeah, uh, to Inkwer, where he gets the cells to start with. Yeah, so it's um, done through a um, completely harmless process. Um, so it's uh, it's called a, a skin biopsy. So um, it's a small. Um, uh, we get a small piece, approximately. Um, I work in cent centimeters, so it's, uh, um, it's half a centimeter, which is what one eighth of an inch or something like that. Um, like a small circular um, piece of, of of skin from a living animal. Um, so again, it's a it's a harmless and uh, and pain free process for the animal, um, and that only needs to happen once, um, because from, from, that, from that one biopsy, we can expand the cells and, uh, and those cells can grow billions and billions of square feet of, uh, of, of leather. Well, fantastic. Cool. Well, I think, uh, I think our time is up. And, okay. uh, well, um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Thank you, Inga, for um, taking the lead on, on uh, mo moderating this. And uh, we will be following up with an email to everyone. And uh, really fantastic, fantastic information. I, I loved hearing about everything. So thank you all very much. And I'll turn it over yeah. to Joanna to close out. Sure, I just want to alert you guys to two environmental programs we're going to have at the library. I'm going to put them in the chat so you can sign up for them. Uh, they are coming up in March. So hopefully you can uh, join us then. Uh, but thank you so much. This was so informative. Great, uh, great session. And uh, like Mary said, we will be uh, emailing everybody with resources, materials, and the video from tonight, uh, probably at the end of the week. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for the panelists. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.